Hello and welcome to the September 2022 podcast from Le Monde Diplomatique. My name's George Miller, and my guest this month is Michael Clare, who's Professor Emeritus of Peace and World Security Studies at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, and author most recently of All Hell Breaking Loose, The Pentagon's Perspective on Climate Change. Before we begin, just a quick reminder that all previous episodes of this podcast are on the website at mondediplo.com, and you can subscribe to it wherever you get your podcasts, so that you never miss another episode. Michael has a piece in this month's edition of the paper entitled The US and China Play with Fire, which looks at how the tensions between these two countries over Taiwan have escalated since Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taipei in early August. Before the visit, China warned it would be regarded as a highly provocative act. Pelosi went ahead nonetheless. So what is the Biden administration thinking? Contain China whatever the cost? As President Xi seeks his party's approval for an unprecedented third term next month, might he feel pressurised into making some show of strength? When I spoke to Michael on the 22nd of September, I began by asking him to explain the US's decades-old policy of strategic ambiguity over Taiwan, a policy it now seems to have abandoned in favour of something much riskier. After the historic visit of President Nixon to China in 1972, I believe it was, uh, the US negotiated with the Chinese over a period of time and finally agreed at the end of 1978 to establish diplomatic relations with China, with formerly with the People's Republic of China, led by the Communist Party of China, switching its uh, recognition from the government in Taiwan, formerly called the Republic of China, which the U.S. had recognized as the government of all of China, because both the government on Taiwan, the Republic of China, and the government in Beijing, the PRC, claimed that all of China included Taiwan and the mainland. So when the United States recognized the mainland government at the end of 1978, it said we acknowledge that uh, there's one China and that it includes Taiwan and that uh, there is only one China. We And we recognize the Beijing view that that includes Taiwan. Following that recognition in which the U.S. established diplomatic ties with Beijing and the ambassadors and so on, and de-recognized Taiwan, Congress, which was not totally happy with this, passed a, a, a bill called the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979, which specifies, uh, number one, that we would maintain quasi-diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Uh, number two, that we would provide Taiwan with defensive weapons as needed. And number three, uh, that the U.S. would consider as a matter of grave concern any attempt to alter Taiwan's status by force. Now, that statement did not, does not include, that remains the law, the Taiwan Relations Act remains the law, that statement does not say the U.S. has an automatic obligation to come to Taiwan's defense in the event that China invaded, but it would consider it a matter of grave concern and would and, and had to be prepared to respond militarily if, if need be. So this is called strategic ambiguity because it isn't specific what the U.S. response would be. And to some degree, for 40-odd years, this has helped maintain the peace in the region because it says to Taiwanese leaders, uh, if you declare independence and China invades, we, we're not guaranteeing you military support. So it acts as a inhibition uh, on, on the Taiwanese leadership not to go too far. At the same time, it tells the Chinese leadership if you use force, 
don't assume that the United States will not intervene. You have to be prepared for U.S. intervention. So that acts a little bit to inhibit the Chinese leadership. So it, it acts in a way as a stabilizing force. Now, that's been for the past 40 years. However, in recent years, as the U.S. has become more hostile to the Beijing regime, feels more threatened by China's rise, and has adopted a policy that should be called containment, intended to block China's rise by bolstering military ties with South Korea, Japan, Australia, the Philippines, and so on. The U.S. looks upon Taiwan differently, no longer as a piece of China whose status has to be carefully managed, but as a potential asset in a future war with China. And so uh, prominent figures in Congress and in the administration have been pushing for a shift in policy towards what you might from what you might call strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity, meaning an ironclad statement that in the event that the Taiwanese declare independence and China invades, the U.S. will automatically intervene and we will have a U.S.-China war with, you know, with unpredictable uh, consequences. This shift has become apparent in the past few months with President Biden making statements that, yes, indeed, the U.S. has a commitment to defend Taiwan. Now, there's no policy that, that's not based in law or in treaty or anywhere else. He's just making that a declaratory policy. But it, it re represents a shift in the thinking of the U.S. leadership. And I guess the, um, the sort of precipitating event for your article, you know, the thing which has really crystallized and made this shift unignorable was the visit by Nancy Pelosi to Taipei at the start of August this year. What sort of diplomatic thinking would have been behind that? And what sort of objective did she have, do you think, in going there? Was it to make unambiguous what had been increasingly, you know, apparent that there was a shift? Was it, to, was it really to nail the US's colours to the mast? You know, it's hard for me to know exactly what was in Nancy Pelosi's mind. I think there was a little grandstanding on her part, you know, a little uh, seeking attention. She's maybe facing the last months of her reign as House Speaker. And this was an incredible stunt, if, if I could put it that way. It got her a lot of attention. I think partly her intent was to push the administration further down the path that I've described of declaring a policy of strategic clarity that the U.S. will come to Taiwan's aid. I also think that there are many people in Washington who look forward to a war between the U.S. and China, or at least a cold war between the U.S. and China, to mobilize the nation to contain China and to bring Taiwan into the U.S. fold, even if that means antagonizing China to the brink of war. So there, there is a very aggressive streak in all of this among many people, many leaders in Washington, a sense that China can be bullied and threatened, and we could get away with that because uh, the U.S. is militarily stronger than China. I do think there is this streak of aggressiveness to what she did. So she clearly did it in full knowledge of just how inflammatory it was going to be. That was, that, that was no accident or byproduct. I mean, from what you're saying, it was almost like the primary intention was to, to, was to goad China. So how has China reacted? Has its reaction been within the, the bounds of predictable or has it 
do you think it's sort of gone further perhaps than might have been expected? Because there there have been responses both sort of rhetorical from politicians, from President Xi, but also militarily in the mobilisation of troops and movements and, and so sort of practical things happening on the ground. So how do you sort of frame that response from China? Is it is it exactly what, what you would expect from someone who studies um, uh, the international geopolitics? Again, you know, it's, a, it's hard to calculate this. I would say that there was a lot of noise and thunder from the Chinese military response. They've sent a lot of ships and planes into the air and into the sea and waters around Taiwan. It's certainly very threatening, and they have kept it up. We keep track of that at our website, saying uh, uschinapolicy.org. We keep track of these maneuvers on both sides, and the Chinese have kept up their maneuvers on a daily basis, sending ships and planes across the median line in the Taiwan Strait between China and the island. So they're certainly keeping up the pressure, but no shots have been fired. There was one missile barrage on August 2nd. I think that was the peak of their military response. And that was pretty threatening. I mean, they were going to do something. And the Missile barrage was an example of that, but it was six missiles, all told, and they haven't repeated that. So I think this was more for domestic show than for anything else, because there had been criticism of Xi for not taking a tougher stance towards Pelosi's visit. There were calls on Chinese social media for China to prevent her from planes from landing, which would have provoked armed conflict for sure. And and she did not do anything that dangerous or provocative. So I think the missile firing and the maneuvers are a lot for domestic consumption in China. I think they're also aimed at the Taiwanese leadership. Because I I think in all of this, I think we, we should make this point very clearly The Taiwanese people's views are not necessarily being consulted in this conversation. Pelosi certainly attracted support from a part of the population that's keen to declare independence at any cost, thinking that the U.S. will come to their support. But I gather from polling data that most Taiwanese people prefer the status quo of strategic ambiguity. They don't want to become a flashpoint for a world war uh, because they know that Taiwan itself will be obliterated in the process and they'll all be dead because that's the likely outcome of a war over Taiwan. That'll be the focal point of all of the violence. So uh, most Taiwanese do not want to see a war um, and would prefer to keep things uh, at a karma level. That is my impression from the polling data. So I think that, that the Chinese a response uh, verbally and otherwise has not been aimed so much as uh, to the U.S. public and the U.S. leadership as to the Taiwanese. And they're saying, you know, on one hand, we have the capacity to attack you if we choose, but that's not our first choice. But what we're saying is do not make a traumatic move. Do not make a provocative move. Do not declare independence. Stay the course, you know, and maybe down the road we can have peaceful reunification and and this problem will go away. But whatever you do, don't move in a direction that will force us to intervene. And I know these things are hard to gauge, Michael, but do you think there's a real danger that President Xi could feel that he's backed into a corner, that, that, that rhetoric and gestures aren't enough and he's actually left with little option but to assert his authority in some more dramatic way? Yes, I I think that's absolutely possible. And I I think that's the intent. That was the intent of Nancy Pelosi's trip, in a way, was to increase the pressure on him, to embarrass, to humiliate him. It was very humiliating of Xi to have this American leader brazenly come to Taiwan after 
she told Biden a few days earlier, don't let her go. This would, this would be crossing a red line. And we would find it to, to be very a hostile act. And she went nevertheless. So in, in a way, it, it was a humiliation of she. And he, uh, he responded with a show of force. I think a tempered show of force. Will there be further provocations that would force China to act? I think there are. If the U.S. abandons the strategic ambiguity and says that Taiwan is now our military ally and stations troops there, I think would be very hard for Xi not to respond in a military fashion, even though it would be very destructive. He's up for for a crucial meeting in uh, mid-October of the National People's Congress, where he's seeking another term as president for five years. And He's got to show strength and virility and all, all of the, those characteristics. So anything that would expose him as being weak might force him to use military force in a more, in a more, uh, a more dangerous way. And you describe in your article how various forms of cooperation between the US and China have been severed in recent weeks as a result of this tension. And that made me think that there is a sort of horrific possibility of war happening almost by accident, you know, through lack of communication, through misunderstanding, misinterpretation. I mean, do you, is that is that something that we should we should see as a, a serious um, possibility, or is that is that perhaps going too far? Oh no! By all means, we should be worried on a daily basis. Just the other day, a U.S. guided missile destroyer sailed through the Taiwan Strait at the same time that Chinese planes and ships are conducting maneuvers in the same general area. And, you know, when a U.S. warship goes that close to China, you could assume that there are other U.S. military assets in the neighborhood ready to come to its assistance if attacked. So it's very easy to imagine a scenario not of intended conflict, but in the sense that both sides are flexing their muscles intentionally and pushing them in each other's face, where a cocky young guy on a plane or a boat, you know, they're, they're 19 or 20 or all pumped up, might act more aggressively than is called for and accidentally shoot down a, another plane or crash into another plane or ram a, a ship ramming. There have been close encounters like this before between U.S. and China, but at a time when relations were not as heated and it was possible for, to calm down the situation without escalation. But if that were to happen now, I very much worry that it would not be so easy to calm things down and you could have a very rapid spiral of escalation. And I wondered, this wasn't something you had space to go into in your article, but I wondered, does the war in Ukraine play any part in the thinking of either President Xi in China or the Biden administration? I mean, it must, seeing what's playing out there, I know that in the early days of, of that conflict, there was talk of... President Xi perhaps being emboldened by seeing what President Putin had done. And that was, you know, that's now several months in the past. And we can see that President Putin has has got bogged down in a way that wasn't anticipated. But how do you think that that very significant conflict might be influencing the thinking at sort of geostrategic level in, in Washington and, and Beijing? Well, first of all, the notion that President Xi was emboldened by Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine is a pure fiction of Washington pundits. I don't think there was ever the slightest bit of evidence for that. I think that that's the work of people who are trying to provoke conflict with China. I don't, I don't think China, I think Chinese leaders see the, from the beginning, saw the Russian invasion of Ukraine as a big mistake. And they've only, their opinion has only moved more in that direction as time has gone on. If they've learned anything from this, it's that invasions uh, of countries where 
the people there are determined to resist are very hard and very difficult. And you don't take this on lightly. It's this that has emboldened the Washington elites. They now feel that they can arm Taiwan to the point where a Chinese invasion becomes impossible. So that's the drumbeat in Washington. It's called the porcupine strategy to provide Taiwan with so many arms, you know, sticking out like a porcupine to make it uninvadable. That is U.S. policy at this point. And that, in spite of the degree to which the Chinese and the U.S. economies are so intimately interlinked to the to the extent that it's very difficult to think about how either would function. You know, it's very different from Russia, which is a a power when it comes to exporting its fossil fuel reserves, but is not so interwoven, so intimately interwoven in the world economy as the US and Chinese economies are. So even the Hawks and Washington are aware of that, but discounted as a factor? You know, I, I think this is one of the craziest things that's happened in modern times, is that the US foreign policy elite is determined to sever the two largest economies in the world, to undo globalization and to create a separate economy built around the United States and Europe and uh, Japan and Australia and so on, one set of supply lines and uh, wall off China and its economic allies on the other at whatever cost to the world economy and to global supply lines. I think this is insane and catastrophic. It'll mean higher prices and shortages. But that is the intent of the foreign policy elite. I should be a little bit more specific and say that it's particularly aimed at cutting off the supply of high technology exports to China with the intent of keeping China as a second-rate technological power. Uh, The U.S. elites understand that what the U.S. has that China doesn't is a a generation, perhaps, or less advantage in the most advanced technologies, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and the like, and that if China catches up, uh, then there's no stopping China's rise. So the goal of all of this is to prevent China from ever catching up technologically with the United States. And Taiwan, of course, we should remember, is highly important as a centre of the, the global semiconductor uh, industry. So it's, it's got great significance in that, in that regard that you've just outlined. Yes. I, I mean, there, there are many who argue in Washington that Taiwan deserves special protection, a special status, precisely because of its critical role in supplying semiconductors to the U.S. But Taiwan supplies more semiconductors to China than it does to the United States at present. Uh, and there are many in Taiwan who want to maintain that those economic ties with the mainland. So uh, this is one of those forces that's arguing against a new Cold War. The U.S. is putting tremendous pressure on the Taiwanese semiconductor industry to move their operations to the United States and to shift their orientation from the mainland to the United States. And this is the intent of the it's it's called uh, it's the the uh, inflation uh, fighting bill that that Congress just passed. But its real intent is to subsidize a semiconductor industry in the United States tied to Taiwan so as to incentivize a shift away from the mainland and towards the United States. If we were talking during a Republican administration, we might be saying, well, the best hope for a saner China policy is a Democratic administration coming in. But it's rather sobering to be thinking that we are actually talking during Biden's presidency and when the next presidential elections come round, we could be looking at even more insistent drumbeats that could lead to war. That That is perhaps one of the most sobering things for someone looking on this from outside the United States, that here we are in what we hoped might be a period that would deliver us from the, 
from the um, the Trump era, and yet we seem to be ratcheting our way towards um, conflict between two um, superpowers. Yes, this is something that has all of us in this country stumped. We had hoped that Biden would practice a more level-headed, sane policy on China, but he's gone in the opposite direction. And there are two things going on here. First of all, I, I, I think and maybe it's harder for people outside the country to appreciate. It's hard for people outside of Washington to grasp what happens in Washington. We talk about the beltway outside the beltway, the beltway that surrounds Washington. Most people outside the beltway do not comprehend what happens inside the beltway, especially on foreign policy. On domestic affairs, they have more, they have a, a, a deeper interest, so they pay more attention. But on foreign policy, decisions in Washington are very opaque and distant and hard to follow. And I'm sure that's true elsewhere. But we, we have a foreign policy elite. Some people call it the blob because it's so impenetrable and uh, immovable. Uh, that, that, uh, is bipartisan and spans administrations. And when it reaches a consensus, it, it moves, it moves like a, a train that you can't stop. And during the Trump administration, the blob came to the conclusion that, that a rising China posed the greatest threat to America's future supremacy and that pushed everything else aside. The global war on terror was pushed aside and even Russia was downgraded as a threat. So uh, if you want to understand Washington American foreign policy, it's China, 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 China all the time. And the war in Ukraine, whatever Biden might say, behind the scenes, they're not thinking about Russia and Ukraine. They're thinking about the impact of Ukraine on China, on Taiwan and China. And this is a unified blob, a unified foreign policy establishment. So it doesn't matter who becomes the next president. The blob will continue to push this line because this represents the thinking of the power elite in the United States. They do not accept the notion of China as an equal status, equal competitor to the United States. But on top of this, President Biden is adopting the same policy as the Trump administration, but he wants to put a gloss on this, that this is all in the name of democracy, that he is the leader of the free world in defending uh, a, a, a democratic world against the autocracies and ki kind of a language you would hear in President Truman's Cold War speech of 1947 and 1948, the same kind of grandiose statements. I think he's been taken with this notion of being the leader of the free world, that this is a great movement of democracies. Of course, he goes to Saudi Arabia, and it includes Saudi Arabia in this alliance of democracies. But that aside, uh, uh, this this gives a certain space for his his cohorts in the Defense Department and even in the White House, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, and Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, who are real China hawks, to to push this strategy of containment with great vigor. I was speaking to Michael Clare, whose piece in this month's paper is entitled the US and China play with fire. You can read Michael's article at mondediplo.com. If you're a subscriber, you can also read every edition of the paper going back 25 years and online exclusive content. And if you're not yet a subscriber, there's plenty of open access content online to entice you to become one, including the full archive of this podcast. You'll find all previous episodes on Le Monde Diplomatique's website, and you can subscribe on your favourite podcast app. In the words of John Berger, why read LMD? To make sense of what's happening in the world behind the misinformation. I hope you'll join me again soon for another interview with one of our contributors. <laughs>
Until then, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye. (laughs) 